Let's do that. Going live. Good evening. My name is Deandra Stansel and I will be your moderator for this class. Welcome to another lecture given by members of the Chicago Northside Zoom class. This is a school and not a church. This school is a nonprofit, non-denominal religious and scientific research organization dedicated to showing proof of the existence of Yahweh, our Elohim, and the operation of his eternal purpose, pattern, and plan operating throughout eternity to this present day. The school was established as a result of a divine vision and revelation given to our founder, Dr. Henry Clifford Kinley in the state of Ohio in the year of 1931. The Dean of the Chicago North Side Zoom class is Dr. John Quates. The president is Dr. Patrick Latortu. Now in this school, we use the true, correct and original name and title of the father, the word or son and the Holy Spirit, which are still contained in the original Hebrew text. The true name of our Heavenly Father is Yahweh and has been improperly substituted by Lord. The true title of the word or son is Elohim. It has been improperly substituted by God. The name of the Holy Spirit manifested in or out, excuse me, of a physical body is Yahshua. It has been erroneously substituted by Jesus Christ. Lord and God are titles and not names. The Apostle Paul filled with the Holy Spirit tells us in 1 Corinthians 8 and 5 that there are Lord's many and God's many. But we now know that each Lord must have a name and each God must have a name also. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, Elohim is a title, but unlike Lord and God, Elohim is a divine title. That means Elohim is the title that our creator chose for himself. Jesus is a name, but it is an erroneous name. A minor investigation on your part in a good dictionary or encyclopedia will prove that neither the Hebrew language, the Greek language, nor the Latin language have any characters or letters in their alphabet that will produce the sound that is made by the letter J. Neither was there a letter J in the English language until some 1400 years after the Messiah's death. Therefore, such names as Jesus and, Jesus and Jehovah are impossible renderings of the true and original name of our father and his son. Christ is a title, just like Lord and God. Yahweh is pure spirit, and in this state, he is incomprehensible and inscrutable. He is the ultimate source, substance, limits, and bounds of everything. We have Yahweh in his pure spirit state, symbolized on this chart as a cloud. Yahweh is not a cloud. He merely chose a cloud to symbolize himself because a cloud has no particular descriptor, shape, or form. We have drawn this cloud all around the edges of this chart to show you that everything on this chart is within the cloud. And like matter, everything in the universe abides within the pure spirit state of Yahweh. Yahweh, knowing that mankind cannot perceive him in this pure spirit state, took on shape and took on form right within himself as long. This is the word or son, a super incorporeal being that is having the shape and form of a man, but without flesh and blood. This form can only be seen in divine visions and revelations. And I'm sorry, and understood in divine revelations. Later on, the self same spirit manifested himself in a physical body and walked the earth plain as Yahshua the Messiah, whom the world calls Jesus Christ. Now, there is only one name given unto salvation, and we must know that name. So, the simple yet intelligent question we should ask ourselves is what was the name of the Savior doing at the time he walked the earth plain? A further understanding of this name and title may be had by reading the preference of the Holy Name Bible. Also at this school, we teach by the divine pattern of the universe. It is called the divine pattern because it is Yahweh's pattern. After Yahweh led the children of Israel out of Israel, he, out of Egypt, he called Moses up top Mount Sinai and showed him the tabernacle pattern in a vision. Yahweh instructed 
Moses to build one exactly like it in the wilderness of Sinai. The pattern consists of a most holy place, a holy place, and a court roundabout. These three compartments make up the one tabernacle pattern. In this school, we show proof that everything in the universe is made and operates according to the structure and function of this threefold tabernacle pattern, and that absolutely nothing escapes the pattern. The objectives and aims of the Chicago North Sand Zoom class are as follows. First, to help you find and know Yahweh, our Elohim, as he really is and actually exists. Second is to form a nucleus of universal brotherhood of humanity in Yahshua the Messiah without the distinction of race, nationality, creed, sex, caste, or color. Third is to investigate the unexplained spirit law or so-called law of nature and the powers latent in men. Fourth is to encourage and promote the study of the scriptures, comparative religious, psychology, philosophy, modern, practical, and occult science. Fifth is to escapade current superstition, skepticism, and ignorance. Sixth is to learn, know, and understand the operation of Yahweh's eternal purpose through the dispensations and ages. Seven is to discern and avoid being deceived by Lucifer, the serpent, the devil, excuse me, the dragon or Satan and his demons operating the mystery of iniquity on earth through the dispensations of time. Eighth is to earnestly contend for the common salvation and faith, which was once delivered unto the sons or children of Yahweh. Ninth is to make known that Yahweh from the beginning ordained there is no other name given among men whereby men can be saved, saving the name of Yahshua the Messiah. And tenth is to inherit eternal life now in the kingdom of Yahshua the Messiah with the hope of immortal glorification in a new earth state. Our watchword is peace and our slogan is to speak the truth. Now, I'm sorry, now um, today's class um, will be dedicated in prayer by Dr. Um, John Quates. And our scripture lesson for today is um, Joel, the second chapter, which will be read by Do uh, Brother Clifford Cardoza. May we now have our prayer. Uh, Joshua, we pray for, but we do know that we need you to be with us at all times to open up our hearts and minds to keep our minds stayed on you so that we might be saved in the past few seconds of time. And we hope that you can give us the understanding and knowledge to praise you forever and forever. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And our scripture lesson. Good morning. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Our scripture lesson is taken from the second chapter of Joel, and I'll be reading the online Holy Name Bible. Joel chapter 2. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain, that all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of Yahweh cometh, for it is nigh at hand. A day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness, as the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong. There hath not been ever like, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. A fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness, yea, and nothing shall escape them. The appearance of them is as the appearance of horses, and as horsemen, so shall they run. Like the noise of chariots on the tops of mountains shall they leap, like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth the stubble as a strong people set in battle array. Before their face, the people shall be in anguish. All faces shall gather blackness. They shall run like mighty men. They shall climb the wall like men of war. They shall march every one on his ways, and they shall not break their ranks. Neither shall one press another. They shall walk every one in his path, and though they march between weapons, they will not change their course. 
They shall run to and fro in the city. They shall run upon the wall. They shall climb upon the houses. They shall enter in at the windows like a thief. The earth shall quake before them, the heavens shall tremble, the sun and the moon shall be dark, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. And Yahweh shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great, for he is strong and he is strong that executeth his word, for the day of Yahweh is great and very terrible. Who can abide it? Therefore also now saith Yahweh, turn ye even to me with all your heart and with fasting and with weeping and with mourning. Rend your heart and not your garments and turn unto Yahweh your Elohim. For he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and it giveth him of the evil. Who knoweth if he will return and relent and leave a blessing behind him, that ye may offer a meal offering and a drink offering unto Yahweh your Elohim? Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, and those that suck the breasts, let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. Let the priests, the ministers of Yahweh, weep between the porch and the altar. Let them say, spare thy people, O Yahweh, and give not thine heritage to reproach, that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, where is their Elohim? Then will Yahweh be jealous for his land and pity his people. Yea, Yahweh will answer and say unto his people, Behold, I will send you corn and wine and oil, and ye shall be satisfied therewith. And I will no more make you a reproach among the heathen, but I will remove far off from you the northern army and will drive him into a land barren and desolate with his face toward east the east sea and his hinder part toward the uttermost the utmost sea and his stink shall come up and his ill savor shall come up because he hath done great things fear not O land be glad and rejoice for Yahweh will do great things. Be not afraid, ye beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness do spring. For the tree beareth her fruit, the fig tree and the vine do yield their strength. Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in Yahweh, your Elohim, for he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. And the floors shall be full of wheat, and the vats shall overflow with wine and oil. And I will restore you, I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the cankerworm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm my great army which I sent among you. And ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of Yahweh your Elohim that hath dealt wondrously with you and my people shall never be ashamed. And ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and I am Yahweh your Elohim and none else and my people shall never be ashamed. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. 
the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and the terrible day of Yahweh come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of Yahweh shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as Yahweh hath said, and in the remnant of whom, whom Yahweh shall call. I have read Joel, the second chapter. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, uh, Dr. Coates and uh, Brother Cardoza. Um, at this time, I just have a few announcements before we get started. May we now take the time to silence all cell phones, um, um, mute them. Um, TVs, laptops, or any other electrical devices that may disturb the speakers. May we now turn off our video feed so we won't have any interruptions. And tonight will be a two speaker format. Um, each speaker will have approximately um, 50 minutes, give or take a few minutes. Um, before, um, when your lecture is drawing near, we will put up a five minute um, sign. If you can please acknowledge that sign and um, wrap up your lecture, that would be great. And I wanna take the time to also acknowledge uh, visiting brethren again, Brother Clifford Cardoza from our Malaysia branch. And uh, we have Connor, I believe, I'm sorry, I don't know your last name, but I believe he's from our um, Texas branch. So thank you for joining us this evening. And our first speaker tonight will be Connor. Hello, brethren. So, well, there's a lot to talk about. And uh, one of the great things that is on my mind right now is where we're at. Um, what, could uh, somebody pull up the ages and dispensations chart, please? Because I do like to prove the things that I'm talking about. Thank you. So if you look at the fourth age, which is the present kingdom age, it, uh, and at the bottom, it says New Testament or New Covenant. And it says the sixth dispensation. And could someone, if we do have a scripture reader tonight, please go back in Exodus, where it talks about how the children of Israel, Yahweh rained down manna from heaven and told them to okay. gather double on the sixth day. Or the seventh day would be rest. And they wouldn't be allowed to do anything. I don't have a Bible with me right now. That's why I'm asking. This is uh, Exodus 16 and starts at uh, 19. And Moses said, let no man leave it until the morning. Notwithstanding, they hearken not unto more. Moses, but some of them left it until the morning, and it bred worms and stank, and Moses was wroth with them. And they gathered every they gathered it every morning, every man according to their eating. And when the sun waxed hot, it melted. And it came to pass that at the sixth day they gathered twice as much bread two omers for one man, and all the rulers of the congregation and told Moses. Uh, is that what you wanted, Dr. But, yes, uh, that, that was what I wanted. Uh, thank you. So, and, uh, if you look at where we're at on the dispensations, it shows the number six. So that's a witness that there's a lot of spiritual food available now. And I was talking to a brother about it earlier today, and I asked him because it's a question that was on the market. I said, "So is everything that we see food?" And I was talking about the transcripts and the pamphlets, the audio tapes, classes, conventions, everything. And this 
the vessel yeah, did answer yeah, me and said, yes, yeah, it's yeah, all that's food. food. So uh, you got background noise coming up. Yeah, the background noise is actually my family because we just got back from the gym. And so they're in the car with me and they're talking. <laughs> um, well, I'm talking to you guys at the same time. So I am sorry about that. Uh, you know, usually I would be at home sitting in my room in a quiet area right now. But I've noticed recently that I've been getting on every single class, no matter where I am, because that's how much I love, you know, being fed by Yasha, to be completely honest. And um, it just, it reminds me how, where is the scripture? Because I don't know where it is. It uh, says that Yahshua the Messiah is the bread of life. Could someone get that for me, please? This is uh, uh, John, I believe it is eight. Uh, I'm sorry, just one moment getting that. This is John, it's John 6. This is John, oh, that's, I am the light, I'm sorry. This is, okay. I'm getting it, Dr. Connor. I'm sorry, I don't know your last name either. <laughs> I, can go, you, I can go ahead and read it if you want. Okay, go, ahead, go ahead. ahead. It's John 6.35, but go ahead. I'm sorry. I oh, I can do there finger. too. All right, uh, this is, um, this is, I'm going to start at 45 and go down. Um, it is written in the prophets that they shall be, be all taught of Elohim. Every man, therefore, that have heard and have heard of the Father cometh unto me. Not that any man hath seen the Father, save he which is of Elohim have seen the Father. Verily, verily. Yeah, I gave you a really train of thought. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. Thank you. That was perfect. Is there more? Yeah, if you want to read it, go ahead. I am, I am that living bread which come down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Thank you. That was great. And um, so Thank you. could we... Whoever's in control of the charts, could you please pull up the tabernacle chart? Thank you. So, if you look at this chart, you'll see that it says most holy place and a holy place and a court roundabout. And the table of shoe bread is actually in the holy place. So it's saying that all the brethren that are eating from Yahshua the Messiah are standing in the holy place. So that's that principle. And then uh, we went over this earlier. But uh, in another chart, we went over on Blood, Water, Spirit 40. And uh, could someone pull up the elementary chart for me, please? Thank you. Okay. So if you look at the first one where it shows the transgression. Uh -huh. Hang on, I gotta bring up my phone screen. 
There we go. Okay, it shows. Oh, I can, okay. There. So it shows that at the bottom, it has uh, death. It has the gravestone and then it has death on it. Could we pick up those verses? It says Genesis 5 and 5. It says Psalms that looks like 40 and 4. I'm not completely sure though. Okay. This is Genesis 5 and 5. And all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. Thank you. And then, yeah. and then Psalms that uh, looks like 90 and 4. Okay. This is Psalms 90, 90 and 4. Psalms 90 and 4. For a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday, and when it is past as a watch in the night, thou continue. And then oh, is it first, first Peter 3 and 8, is that? Yes, that's... Okay. It, it looks like Second Peter 3 and 8. Second Peter, okay. Yes. Second yes. Peter 3 and 8. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day with Yahweh is as a thousand years, and as a thousand years as one day. Well, that, that was a very good one. So, uh, okay. And then, as you can see there, I, uh, it says sweat of his face. So that's a blood and a water principle. And then... Uh, could you scroll up on there? It should show uh, the angel, the angel Michael, the archangel Michael, with the flaming sword uh, casting Adam and Eve out of the garden. So that would be the principle of spirit. And then in Noah, there's uh, also a death, a burial, and a resurrection. So Uh, I'm looking for the right one. Hey, dude. Genesis 7, 13 through 14. Nope, that's the one below that. It's uh, 7, 13. No, it, it's not 7, 13 through 14. It's the one below it where it says the wicked are warned. Okay. That's um, six and eleven. Mm -hmm. This is Genesis six and eleven. The earth was corrupt before Yahweh, and the earth was filled with violence. And Yahweh looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And Yahweh said unto Noah, the end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make thee an ark of gopher wood, room shalt thou make it in the ark, and pitch it within and without with pitch, for this is the fashion which thou shalt make of it. The length of the ark shall be three hundred cubits and the breadth of it 50 cubits, and the height of it 30 cubits. A window thou shalt make to the ark, and in a cubit shalt thou finish it above, and the door of the ark shalt thou set in the side thereof, with lower, second, and third story shalt thou make it. And behold, I, even I, do 
bring a flood upon of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life from under heaven, and everything that is in the earth shall die. But with thee I will establish my covenant, and thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons and thy wife and thy son's wives with thee. Thank you. So that was... I am back in my room now, so it's going to be quieter. Um, Do you so, want Ezekiel? Yeah. So, okay, this is Ezekiel 33, 4 through 6. Then whosoever heareth the sound of the prophet, and shall taketh not warning, if the sword comes and, he, and take him away, his blood shall be upon his head. He heard the sound of the trumpet and took not warning, his blood shall be upon him. But he that taketh warning shall deliver his soul. But if the watchman sees the sword come and blow not the trumpet, and the people be not warned, if the sword come and take any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. Thank you. Both of those were perfect, and they talk about the principle of blood. Um, so on the middle of the chart, this will be the holy place of the Noah, Noah and the flood chart. It has one verse, it looks like. It's uh, 7, Genesis 7, 7 through 12. Genesis, Genesis, seven. Yep, that's Genesis 7 and 7 through 12. Okay, this is Genesis 7 and 7. And Noah went in and his sons and his wife and his son's wives with him into the ark because of the waters of the flood of clean beasts and of beasts that are not clean and of the fowls, fowls and everything that creepeth upon the earth. There went in two and two unto Noah into the ark, the male and the female, as Yahweh had commanded Noah. And it came to pass after seven days that the waters of the flood were upon the earth. And in the six hundredth year of Noah's life, in the second month, the seventeenth day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened. And the rain was upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. Thank you. That was great. So that was the principle of blood and water in that one. And then after that one, um, it had, you can look in the, in the most holy place and you can see an angel uh, coming into Noah unto Noah and his family after Noah's uh, sacrifice unto Yahweh, which, if I'm correct about this, is of clean beasts and not anything dirty. Um, what does that say, Genesis 8 and 20? Um, that is 8 and 20. That is 8 and 20. <sighs> okay. okay, this is Genesis, Genesis 8 and 20. And Noah built an altar unto Yahweh and took every clean beef and every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings of the altar. I'm sorry, offered burnt offerings on the altar. Mm -hmm. That's good. And then... Um, all right, so that's blood, water, spirit, and then I'm not sure I know where the principle, oh, yes, the principle of 40 would be when it rained. It rained for 40 days and 40 nights. Um, I forget where that is. Let me see if I can find it.
Genesis 7 and 12, maybe? Where the 40 days and 40 nights? Yep, uh, that is it. Okay, this is Genesis 7 and 12. And the rain was upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. Thank you. That was great. Uh, how much time do I have left? You have about uh, less than 32 minutes. Okay, that's that's enough. That's a good amount of time. Um, okay, so now could we go to the tabernacle pattern chart? It's right after. Actually, we'll do both. We'll do the migratory pattern and the tabernacle pattern. So, mm -hmm. okay. So if you look all the way at the court roundabout for the migratory pattern, it says Israelites in Egypt. And then it also has Passover of the Paschal Lamb. And it has uh, the four points of blood. One on the top, one on both sides, and then there was a basin of blood at the bottom. Uh, it's 12. I'm trying to find it where it talks about them striking the uh, lentil and the side posts of the door. That's in the 12th chapter. Yeah. Um. This is Exodus. Did you want that, Dr. Connor? Yes. Yes, please. This, this is Exodus. I'll start at uh, 12, and, 12 and 6. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. And you shall keep it up until the 14th day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door posts of their houses wherein they shall eat it. Thank you. So uh, this is going to be a side by side comparison. Um, if you look at it right next to it, it shows the brazen altar of sin sacrifice, sin offering. That is symbolizing both blood and symbolizing death. And uh, also symbolizing the sacrifice of Yahshua the Messiah. So the second one, the second principle in here would be the Red Sea. Um, there's actually two principles in this one. So could we get that? It's, I can't read it. It's blurry. It's, it's first, uh, it's second Corinthians. I think it's first Corinthians 10 and 10, one through four. All right. So yes, uh, we'll get that one too. Oh, I just lost my place in the Bible. That's okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you said it's 1 Corinthians 10, 1 to 4? Yep. All right, so I'm going to read that one. So oh. the reader. Oh, you want to read it? Go ahead. Yes, 1 Corinthians 10 and 1. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all of our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same did all eat the same spiritual meat, and did all drink the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that led them, and that rock was the Messiah. Yeah, thank you. So um, I have something to bring out. This was on my mind earlier when I was talking to the other vessel about uh, food and water, spiritual food and spiritual water. And it does say right there that they all passed under the cloud and they did eat and they did drink of that spiritual rock, which was Yahshua the Messiah. It also says it back in Exodus when uh, the, it was Moses, Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu and the seven elders of Israel. When they saw Elohim 
it says that they ate and they drank. Uh, it's, it's just really beautiful because that's what we're doing now. We're eating both spiritually and drinking spiritually. Uh, but I don't want to get too far off topic. So if you look over to the tabernacle pattern, it lines it up with the brazen labor, uh, which also is twofold. It has a meaning of burial, um, burial or like immersion, um, water or burial. So that's the twofold there. And then does the wilderness, could you scroll up a little bit to the wilderness of Sinai, tabernacle? Thank you. Okay. Well, it doesn't have it, so I'll, I'll correlate it. Uh, so when they um, built this tabernacle in the wilderness of Sinai and Moses was told to come up into the mountain, he was uh, given light and he was told to bring it back down and make the tabernacle. And uh, it, it correlates because... There was one thing that I, I remember is the way the tabernacle was set up. It was set up uh, with the gate facing the east. So when the sun rose up early in the morning, it shone light into the tabernacle. And then at the ninth hour, they snuffed out the candle because there was light in the tabernacle. But at three o'clock in the afternoon, the low pre the uh, priest would go in. The low priest uh, would go in, and he would light the, uh, the the candlestick, the seven branch candlestick, and uh, it has it right there in the tabernacle, off to the left, the seven branched golden candlestick. And uh, so that's showing a continuous light. Uh, there's never any darkness. And uh, I could bring that up to date now, which would be in our, in our minds and in our hearts when Yahshua is preaching the gospel unto us. It, it's always giving us light. And it feels better to be in the light than it does in the darkness. That, that's just how I see it. Um, so, yeah, there's continuous light. And uh, it, we also know that light is correlated to understanding. Uh, I, I've heard people say this before. When, they, uh, when someone is talking about a particular subject and they don't stop talking about it, like Yasho, people talk about Yasho the Messiah. They glow. People will say, wow, you really glow. And uh, I, I heard that from Teresa and uh, one of her family members, Mary, because she was talking about Yasho the Messiah to Mary. And Mary said, wow, you really glow when you talk about that. Or you really glow, showing the principle of light. And uh, you can associate light with Yasho the Messiah because he is the light. And then a uh, table of shoe bread. So in the wilderness of Sinai, the children of Israel were hungry constantly. And they would, uh, I don't know where this is, so someone might need to get it. But they would murmur constantly against Yahweh, saying that they were hungry and that they didn't have any food to eat. So... What Yahweh did was he rained down manna from heaven and gave them food uh, to sustain them. And it's just really beautiful how that's what he does with us now. He, uh, he's raining down food from heaven uh, and, and he's giving it to us. We didn't have to go out and search for it. He, he gave it to us just like he did the children of Israel. 
And uh, it's just, it's really great because the food is everywhere. And then, so the next vessel that we have in the tabernacle pattern will be the altar. Oh, someone put in Exodus 16 and 3. Does someone want to get that? Yes, this is Exodus 16, I've started too. And the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said unto them, Would Yahweh we had died by the hand, with, by the hand of Yahweh in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots and did eat bread to the full, for you have brought us forth into this wilderness to kill the whole assembly with hunger. Then Yahweh said unto Moses, Behold, I will rain down bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day, that I may prove them whether they will walk in my law or no. Thank you. That was really good. And um, so... The, and that was with the table of Shubra, the golden table of Shubra. So the next one will be the golden altar of incense. And uh, this one is very, very beautiful because with this one, it correlates. Does it have any scriptures? No, it doesn't. But uh, this one correlates with a couple things. Uh, in the law, back in Exodus when the children had to do it, they had to offer up uh, incense for this altar of incense. And this would be like a, a physical way of praying to Yahweh, uh, which does not, it's not valid at this time and day. Um, so, and to, to bring that up to today, that's what we all do constantly. We all pray. Uh, well, keep in mind, the children of Israel, also, they had to do this every day. So they were praying to Yahweh every single day that they were alive. And uh, that's what we do now. We have to pray to Yahweh without ceasing. Um, does anyone know where the scripture is for that? Pray to Yahweh always without ceasing. Uh, that is uh, in Thessalonians. We'll get that for you, Dr. Connor. Um, first Thessalonians is at five, maybe in <clears throat> five and, and, and 16. Uh, I'll start at 15. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing. Thank you, that was, that was great. Um, so in this, in the tabernacle pattern, we see it, it's a blood water spirit. And the most holy place and holy place are considered spirit. If you look at uh, one of the other charts, which has, uh, it, I believe it's the 40 plate chart. It has on the veils, it has the invisible or the unseen. And that would be in the holy place. And in the most holy place, it is the inscrutable or incomprehensible. So there's your blood, water, spirit line. And then following to the next one, it would be the unity of the spirit. I like this one a lot. And there's a reason why. It, uh, in order for you and every other, oh, is that? Yes, that's it. Thank you. So as you see right there, it says, in the most holy place, it says inscrutable and incomprehensible. And then in the holy place, it has invisible or unseen. And uh, that's spirit. So spirit is invisible. And it's 
unseen with the physical eyes. You can see spirit with understanding, but Yahweh has to give it to you uh, through divine vision and revelation. You can't see it normally. Um, so you can take the physical creation and you can see spirit through the physical creation. Or if you go to the law and the prophets, you can see spirit through the correlations and the principles uh, that are lined up in the uh, creation, law and the prophets, your physical life, uh, pretty much everything, the entire universe, all of it, it shows spirit through understanding and knowledge of the law and the prophets, the physical creation, your body, uh, just pretty much everything, which is, there's no excuse. There's no excuse to not know anything. So the second chart, not second chart, but the, uh, this plate we have here, which is the unity of the spirit, you'll see at the bottom in uh, the court round the bottom of the chart, it has blood, water, and it has spirit in the holy place at the bottom. In order for you to live and survive on this physical planet in this physical universe, you have to have blood in your water, in your body. You have to have water in your body. And in order for your body to move and function, uh, and driving, eating, anything, you have to have spirit in it or spirit animating your body so that's a witness of blood water spirit 40 and then it witnesses to yahweh elohim yashua because yahweh is the pure spirit state everything is in him and then you have elohim that's the incorporeal state and you have yashua but it's not three different people. It's all one being because Elohim and Yahshua, the Messiah, both come from Yahweh. So it's showing, and you can see it in the names too, when it says um, Yahweh, Yahweh Elohim, and Yahshua, the Messiah. Yah is in every single one of those uh the names of the, of uh, the father yep right there thank you see um because when we when we refer to yahweh we say yahweh elohim uh but it's so it's yahweh yahweh elohim and yahshua the messiah and uh you can see it right there where it says most holy place, most holy, holy court roundabout. It was one tabernacle, but yet it was three components. And uh, it's, it's the same thing with our Bibles. Our Bible was three parts too. It's law, prophets, and then the fulfillment all in one. And then water is also the same thing. It's uh, ice, liquid, or gas, but yet it's still H2O. It's still water. All it did was change forms. And uh, it's cool because it shows the power that Yahweh has. He has the ability to change forms and be what he wills to be. As it shows right there in the Aya Asher chart, Aya Asher, Aya, I will be what I will to be. And uh, Yahweh willed to be everything. And uh, that's what Yahshua is. The Elohim book has a picture of it. It has a picture of the process of transmutation. Uh, first, it has Yahweh. I forget what the pages are and everything. But it has Yahweh in his pure spirit state. And uh, it's, a, it's a picture of a cloud with all the attributes inside the cloud. 
And then it has the second picture, it's Yahweh Elohim in the super incorporeal form. Uh, but in this picture, he was by himself. He didn't create anything yet. The third picture, it's the same thing, but now he has angels around him. And uh, this is also the origin of the bad spirit, as we call Lucifer. Uh, but I'm not going to get into that. So then the fourth picture, it has a picture of the planet Earth with the animals and humans and the water and the land on it. And uh, behind it is a universe. But it also has Yahshua, the Messiah, sitting on top of the planet with the halo over his head. Uh, showing that Yahweh, Elohim, Yahshua is everything. You cannot escape Yahweh. It is impossible. Absolute impossibility. And, um, oh, there's another good one. See how it says a woman immersed or Adam in deep sleep. So scientists say that sleep is the closest thing to death that you can experience while you're alive so adam was in a state of death and then it says a uh, spiritual immersion and it has a dove with a light shining over yashua or adam that's a principle of burial and then he's resurrected in the holy place where it says adam presented with eve uh so, and they were both alive and then if you keep going up the trait it shows the ascension adam and eve at perfect peace uh in the garden and that's showing uh death burial and resurrection and it also shows the same principles that yashua the messiah went for because uh, he went through a death, burial, and resurrection for his wife. Because Ad, uh, not Adam, Eve was in the transgression and she partook of the, it was an olive. It wasn't an apple. I've done my research. It's an olive. So she partook of the olive tree and she died in her spirit. And gave also unto her husband. And he didn't say no, but he died for her, uh, also putting him in sin as well. But it's the principle, and the principle is that he died for his wife. Yahshua and Messiah did the same thing for the Jews and the Gentiles and us today. Uh, and the angels and everything is he he died for his wife the the creation the uh, assembly um are are his bride he calls them his wife and uh i know earth is also named mother earth representing that it's a female so the creation is the female in Yahshua's eyes, as well as the assembly or the brethren. Um, and it's not just us, it's us and angels. Uh, as it says, an innumerable company of angels. You have come to Mount Zion and to an innumerable company of angels. So could you go back over to the Ages and dispensations chart, please. Thank you. So it shows it's a spiritual assembly body of Yahshua. And uh, th this was revealed to me earlier, and it's really, really beautiful. But so you guys know how Adam was created on the sixth day of creation he was made from the dust of the ground 
And uh, it's a really beautiful principle because we're at the sixth dispensation right now. And Yahshua, the Messiah, is building up his body right now. Yeah, the spiritual body, which we call Elohim. It's just a cool, cool little correlation showing that uh, the man, again, is being made on the sixth day. Or in this case, it's the sixth dispensation. And um, it, it's just, it's marvelous. It includes the angels and it includes us. And we're all being gathered together. And this is happening now, by the way. It's not going to happen later. This is happening now that we're all being buried, not buried. We're all being put together into this body. Yeah. And uh, we're not in the fifth age yet. We haven't gotten there yet. We're still in the fourth age. But the body is just being built, uh, built together upon more and more and more as time in Yahweh's purpose goes on. And it's just, uh, it's a really beautiful thing because when you really look at it, uh, th this is how I see it. You have Yahshua, the Messiah, who's the head. Okay, and then you have the angels and us, which are his body. And just like you feed your body, uh, you feed your body every day. You give it water or whatever drink you give it. And you clean it. You wash it. Yahshua, the Messiah. And you, you give it other things too, like rest. Uh, and, and entertainment and all these other things. It's just so beautiful because Yahshua the Messiah, and I know I say that word a lot, but Yahshua the Messiah is doing the exact same thing now in this present kingdom age. He's giving us food. He's giving us water. Uh, he's giving us, he, he's washing us of everything that's going on and if if anybody says that they're perfect in this age then they're a liar because i still have a physical body on so that means that i am not perfect and i'm pretty sure anyone else who has a physical body on is not perfect either we all got problem a problem and it's that we have a physical body oh i have five minutes okay um and, it's just marvelous. It's just beautiful. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm happy and glad and very joyful. And all the other words that I don't even know to be able to express um, how I feel about this. Grateful. You know, it's, it's a blessing. And uh, not everybody gets to partake in it so you know, just be grateful and always thank uh yahweh Elohim through yahshua the messiah for everything literally everything even the bad things because the bad things don't kill you but they make you better in his eyes don't get me wrong they may seem horrible to us I know I have had many experiences where the bad things were just straight up horrible, but it's all for his purpose. And the bad things in this life are for your benefit to make you better spiritually and psychologically and uh, training you. Like when you go to the gym. I heard this from a vessel earlier, how muscles repair it. The best way to gain strength is by resistance. And you know, when you go to the gym, you work out your muscles with resistance and you get stronger. So likewise, the devil has to be an asset to Yahweh's purpose. You get plagued by the devil or, or tried and uh, tempted and you go through bad things. And more bad things will happen because we're still in a physical creation. Uh, so be ready for them. 
but as you go through them and you, and you keep going through these bad things, you'll just get stronger and stronger and stronger until he takes this creation out. You know, that's all he wanted me to share today. So, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Um, thank you, visiting brother and uh, Dr. Connor. And for our, our second speaker for this evening, it would be a pleasure to call on Dr. Rose Taylor. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I am very grateful to Yashua for another day to uh, come to class and to uh, continue learning about my creator as he really is and as he actually exists. If it be the will of Yahshua just to share something through me as a vessel um, and all praise, honor, and glory go on to Yahshua the Messiah. <clears throat> I uh, enjoyed the, I really enjoyed the remarks of the first speaker. Um, is very edifying. And if we can go back to Exodus, the 12th chapter, where he was talking about how they had to put the blood on the, um, on the door of their houses because, you know, we're coming down here to learn about Yahshua and that you know, ultimately we learned that we have to have Yashua, the Holy Spirit in us as a, as a quickening spirit in order to escape, escape, you know, the lake of fire. I mean, if we don't have the blood of Yashua, the Messiah in us, and it's not physical blood, but in going back um, to the law and the prophets, as we're instructed, those things are pointing to and testifying to Yahshua and their spiritual principles uh, that are laid down uh, therein um, because it takes the natural things to understand the spiritual things. As it says in Romans 1, 19 and 20, the natural things are pointing to spiritual things so that Yahweh Elohim has He's not giving anybody an excuse for not knowing him as he really is and as he actually exists. And he chose out a set group of people for a period of time uh, to reveal his laws and ordinances to, uh, and to bring them out of Egypt or take them on a migration from Egypt through the divided waters of the Red Sea into the wilderness of Sinai. They spent some 40 years there. And then through the divided River Jordan and on into Canaan's land, where they received uh, a land flowing with milk and honey or the land that was promised through Abraham that he would bless his seed as his stars of heaven and the sands of the sea. But that physical migration is a type and shadow of a spiritual migration. Um, and they receive in a, in a type or shadow uh, by receiving an inheritance in Jerusalem is likely to uh, being part or receiving the kingdom or Jerusalem above, see, or being made part of Yahshua's kingdom when they receive that physical inheritance, a land flowing with milk and honey. But that's the natural migration going to Jerusalem isn't going to put us in the kingdom or in the body of Yahshua the Messiah. But there are principles laid down in the migration uh, to point to Yahshua the Messiah and to point to how a man can leave Egypt spiritually and psychologically. But if it be the will of Yahshua, just to uh, go back to Exodus 12 and 1. Um, so, um, well, before that, maybe we can get Exodus, the third chapter where Yahweh had commissioned Moses uh, to go back down into Egypt. We know that Pharaoh uh, was a god of Egypt or the head man and boss, so to speak. Uh, and Yahweh Elohim, he... And according to his purpose, he purposed to bring 
brought his body up out of Egypt. But before he did that, uh, he commissioned Moses to go down and to tell Pharaoh to let his people go. And, and, and then he also revealed the true name uh, to Moses. And it's through that name that destroyed uh, Egypt, and he poured out some 10 devastating plagues, but Moses is commissioned to go down with the name of Yahweh. So let's get Exodus, the third chapter, um, where Moses is at the burning bush, and he sees a uh, bush appear to burn, uh, but it was not consumed, and uh, we'll just read a little bit there. This is Exodus 3 and 1. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of Elohim, even to Horeb. And the angel of Yahweh appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. And when Yahweh saw that he turned aside to, to see, Elohim called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here am I. And he said, draw not nigh hither. Put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest, his holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am Elohim. I am the Elohim of thy father, the Elohim of Abraham, the Elohim of Isaac, and the Elohim of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon Elohim. Verse 7. And Yahweh said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. Okay, so if you can just pause there. So Yahweh, he's, he's omnipresent. Yahweh, uh, our creator, he, he, he's not like going off and doesn't know what's happening. Uh, he has the ability to be everywhere at the same time because Yahweh is spirit. And he said, look, I've seen the affliction and I know their sorrows, uh, sorrows excuse me. Continue on. This is Exodus 3 and 8. And I'm come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land unto a good land and a large unto a land flowing with milk and honey unto the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. Okay, so it's Yahweh that's going to bring the children of Israel out of Egypt. He said, look, I'm going to come down and do the job. Now, he's setting up a type and a shadow because it's the still, it's still the self-same Yahweh Elohim that's bringing up us out of Egypt. And Egypt represents darkness, misaram, chaos, Babylon. And he's setting up a natural type and shadow so that we can come to a knowledge and understanding that in the way that he brought children of Israel up out of Egypt, he can bring us up out of Egypt as well, spiritually so and psychologically so, um, being in that dark, uh, alienated state from Yahweh in Egypt, uh, worshiping all kinds of uh, gods and deities, um, there, you know, anything can be a god, uh, people, uh, uh, ministers, rabbis, um, just anything, you know, like Pharaoh was a god in Egypt. Uh, so we're down here in Egypt, uh, spiritually and psychologically, and it's purpose of Yahweh to bring us up out of Egypt. And he's doing that by himself. He's doing that also by a pattern. And, um, he showed Moses, he said, look, you have to go down in Egypt. Um, he's going to tell Moses uh, who he is. He's going to reveal the true name unto Moses. In the same way, when we come into this class, you know, from the world, we're in Egypt. And one of the first things we learn is the true name of our creator. So we can begin the process of our spiritual migration out of Egypt. So let's jump over to Exodus 3. And, and 
uh, 12, well, started 3 and 11, and then we'll just read a little bit more. Okay. This is Exodus 3 and 11. And Moses said unto Elohim, Who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, Certainly I will be with thee, and this shall be a token unto thee that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, ye shall serve Elohim upon this mountain. And Moses said unto Elohim, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The Elohim of your fathers hath sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? So and Moses, and, and Moses asked an important question because he knew that there, he he was born and raised in Egypt. He fled Egypt after he killed uh, an Egyptian. And he knew that there were all kinds of gods in Egypt. So he's asking an important question. When I go back down there, what shall I say? Who has sent me? Continue on. Exodus 3 and 14. And Elohim said unto Moses, I will be what I will to be. And he said, thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I will be hath sent me unto you. And I'm reading from the online Holy Name Bible. Um, verse 15, 3 and 15. And Elohim said, moreover unto Moses, thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, Yahweh, the Elohim of your fathers, the Elohim of Abraham, the Elohim of Isaac, and the Elohim of Jacob, hath sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. So he revealed the true name unto Moses, and that's the true name that we're still holding on to now. Uh, I think in, uh, Yahshua said in as John 5 and 43, that I am come in my father's name, and ye receive me not. But another shall come in his own name, and him you sh shall receive, or him you will receive. And the whole world has accepted Lord and God, which are titles and not names. Uh, they've accepted Allah, Jesus, uh, Buddha, uh, Krishna. Uh, but see, these are not the true name. That's not the true name and title. Those things, those are all pagan uh, deities. Those are uh, titles. Uh, the creator has a name. His name is Yahweh, Elohim, and Yahshua. And Yahshua means Yahweh is salvation, see? So he said, look, when you go down there, you take this name unto Pharaoh. And Yahweh said he's going to execute judgment on the gods of Egypt, see? And so that's the same thing he's doing down here now. He's executing judgment. And so we're down here to learn of him so we can escape his wrath. And let's get Exodus, the 12th chapter, and just read a little bit, 12 and 1, how he... Um, how he um, instituted the Passover supper. And so um, the Passover um, is one of the 613 laws. Uh, the Passover, they call it the Lord's Supper. Uh, we learned down here in his school that those things were fulfilled in Yahshua the Messiah. Those things were brought to an end. But this is where the institution of it was with a specific group of people for a specific period of time, and that they were going to leave Egypt by eating, see, this Passover meal and being um, obedient unto Yahweh and putting the blood on the door, as was said by this, the first speaker, going through the brazen labor, that principle of a death, a burial, and a resurrection, or principle of blood, water, and spirit. So this is how we leave Egypt spiritually and psychologically also by preaching or believing the true uh, gospel of Yahshua the Messiah, how he died according to the scriptures, how he was buried according to the scripture and how he resurrected according to the scriptures the third day and how he poured out the gift of the Holy Spirit and that those things, that those 
uh, stories, uh, those events in the Bible are pointing to and testifying to spiritual principles of leaving darkness, chaos, and confusion, going through the Red Sea, being washed and clean, see, and being led by the Spirit, or uh, as the children of Israel were led by a cloud, it was an angel in a cloud, it was a pillar of fire by night and cloud by day. And so that's the Romans 1, 19 and 20 of how they left Egypt, self same way we're leaving Egypt, spiritually and psychologically, see, but there is a meal you have to be eating. There's the death of the lamb and that lamb is pointing to and it's testifying to the true lamb which is Yahshua the Messiah. So let's get uh, Exodus 12 and one and we'll uh, read down a little bit there. This is Exodus 12 and one. And Yahweh spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt saying, this month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel saying, in the 10th day of this month, they shall take to them every man a lamb according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his house take it according to the number of souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. And if, if you can pause just for a minute so it says look every man shall take out a lamb a lamb per house see and so it's it's a type and shadow that we all have to have our a true report of Yahshua the Messiah we all have to have the blood of the lamb in us these tabernacles or these bodies and it talks about in first Corinthians 6 19 it says what know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit so we have to have the lamb in us see each individual Individual. No man can get into the body of Yahshua the Messiah if he does not have Yahshua the Messiah in him. And so when he set that principle up, he said, every man, according to his eating, you must make your count for the lamb. So we're all individually, we must individually make our count for the lamb. This is not a partnership thing. It's not a coattail thing. It is not, well, you know, an association kind of thing. It is, if Yah is Yahshua the Messiah in the house, in each and every one of us, and we have to make our count for the lamb. So that's why he's, he's really detailing it out. Every man, you got to make your count for the lamb. See, continue on. This is Exodus 12 and 5. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. Ye shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. And ye shall keep it up until the 14th day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it between the two evenings. So he's saying, look, take out a lamb. It's going to point to Yahshua. He's going to talk about how that lamb shall be. He said, a male of the first year. He's going to be without spot or blemish. Now, Yahshua the Messiah, see, so, see, he's, he's the lamb, see, slain from the foundation of the world. And that Yahweh came down from his pure spirit state. He took on shape and form as Yahweh Elohim, which he showed himself to Moses, Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu atop Mount Sinai. And that self-same spirit, Yahshua the Messiah, was manifested in the flesh, see. Now, he's the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. He's the only lamb lamb that's without spot or blemish. So we're going to hold that um, just for one second here. We'll come back to that and we'll get um, I Isaiah 53 and 7 and then we'll get John 1 29 because we just want to pick up that. See that that's a type and a shadow and an allegory. He's a male without spot or blemish. Um, he had no sins. Uh, he took on the sins of mankind, see, so that those who would believe in him might be saved, see. He's the only one that could come all the way down and do the job himself, see. Only Yahshua the Messiah, see, because it says, um, as was talked about in the first speaker, um, that, that 
Adam and Eve, see, they were driven out, see, from the garden. They disobeyed the commandment of Yahweh. And so they were at one, at one point in the, in the garden, see, at peace with their creator. But by and by, and that wasn't an accident, it, you know, scholars and people try to say, well, God had to pick something up because Eve messed up, not knowing that was the purpose of Yahweh. He said that, man, the first man died for his bride, then a second Adam. See, he's going to come die for his bride. And that second Adam is Yahshua the Messiah. And so uh, it was a part of the purpose, see, the man had to come down, see, because Joshua and Messiah going to pick him up where he fell, and he fell in his heart and mind. He disobeyed the commandment of Yahweh. So let's get Isaiah 53 and 7, and then uh, John and 1 and 29. This is Isaiah 53 and verse 7. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. So now they're prophesying of Yahshua the Messiah. See, they're talking about him. Yahshua the Messiah said, look, search the scriptures in John 5, 39, and them you think ye have eternal life. Now he's talking to the scribes and Pharisees, the leaders of Israel, those that were the uh, 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 the head of those the Israelites, um, they thought they had some salvation, uh, but not knowing that those things, see, were pointed to and testifying to Yahshua. So he said he's led as a, a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before his shears is dumb, so he opened out his mouth. Now we, we learned down here uh, in this school that, see, when Yahshua the Messiah, after he kept the Passover, see, because he was born, um, born under the law, see, came through the Je Jewish lineage, Hebrew lineage, but he was not, he was not Mary and Joseph's seed, uh, the angel, uh, we learn, see, over, it's either in Luke or Matthew, where the angel came to Mary and Joseph, he said, look, don't be afraid to marry her, because that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit, because Mary was found with child, so that was divinely placed therein, Yahshua and Messiah came through the loins, but that was not Joseph and Mary's seed, and so, uh, we learn by and by that, see, he's going to bring salvation. Say, he said he's going to save his people from their sins. So he's the lamb without spot and blemish. And Adam, when he died, and Eve, uh, in their hearts and in their mind, it says over in Romans 5, I believe, in 12, in Adam, all died. So you have this death-like state or being carnally minded or being dead, see, that, that there is a conversion or change that has to take place from being in darkness to being one in light or illumination. And there is a process of leaving Egypt spiritually and psychologically, learning about your creator, growing in a knowledge of him, receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit and see that heart and mind can be changed from one being dead to being one being made alive. And it's only be, being made alive through Yahshua the Messiah and receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit. And we continuing on our journey, on our migration. Um, so it says he's led as a, a sheep to the slaughter. We know that after Yahshua kept the Passover, uh, he went to a garden, he prayed, he was arrested. And when he, after he was arrested, they beat him, they dragged him from pillar to post, and they questioned him. And when he was before Pontius Pilate, uh, and he was questioning them, and he said, look, I find no guy I find no guile in him. So he's talking about Yahshua the Messiah because, see, all the the uh, leaders or the people of Israel wanted Yahshua to be crucified. They say crucify him. He, they were given a choice between him and Bar Barnabas or Barabbas, uh, a murderer. And they say, look, we want him crucified. And then Pontius Pilate, maybe... Um, We'll hold that. We won't. We don't have to jump over there and get that. But he said, "Look, what has this man done? Or I find no fault, or I find no guile in him." So he's the Lamb 
without spot or blemish. And so he took on the sins. And let's get to uh, John 1 and 29. So we're talking about Yahshua the Messiah being the true lamb, the lamb without spot or blemish, the, the lamb that they had to have on the meal, the roasted lamb. It was also unleavened bread and it was also bitter herbs. So let's get John 1 and 29. This is John 1 and 29. The next day, John seeth Yahshua coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of Yahweh, which taketh away the sin of the world. So John is seeing Yahshua the Messiah see afar off, see, and he's calling him a lamb. See, because he see the whole thing has been written by Yahshua. See, yeah, see, he's the author and he's the finisher of our faith. He chose men down through the ages and down through the dispensations. He said, the word of Yahweh came unto say, write this and do that and perform this. Even John said, let's get John third chapter three and 11, when he was gonna be baptized in Yahshua the Messiah. And you had to come to, you had to come to John to confess your sins. Now, this is the baptism of repentance, see? And so when he comes to, Yahshua comes unto him, see, uh, they're going to have a conversation about this. But see, Yahshua the Messiah, see, he's fulfilling, see? See, the Israelites, see, they went through the divided waters of the Red Sea. They were given 613 laws. They had washings and ordinances under the law. So here comes Yahshua the Messiah, born of a woman, made under the law so uh we don't let let's get that in in matthew 3 and 11 see because he's fulfilling he's the lamb without spot or blemish see he kept the passover uh he's going to be baptized and buried or immersed see uh and it's the baptism of repentance. But when he got baptized, that was done. It was complete in Yahshua the Messiah. That completed all physical forms of baptisms that were valid. It was done. It was nailed to his cross. But let's get uh, Matthew 3 and 11. This is Matthew 3 and 11. I indeed immerse you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall immerse you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Continue on. Verse 12. Whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner. But he will burn up the shaft with unquenchable fire. Okay, continue on. Verse 13, then cometh Yahshua from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be immersed of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be immersed of thee, and comest thou to me? Okay, let's pause right there. So look, John, he said, look, I'm not the one. See, and he also is saying, look, it's it's one to come that's, that's mighty, mightier than I. He's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Now, that's the true baptism that we want down here in this present kingdom age. Because, see, after Yahshua was crucified, he brought those things to an end. And the true baptism isn't with water anymore. Not in the, on this side of the cross. Uh, and the new covenant is is written in our hearts and mind now the true baptism is with what the holy spirit and with fire now there is a cleaning that's going up and i believe it was in the scripture lesson talking about being washed and clean and it talks about being clean by the word of sea now there's a preaching of the gospel that's cleaning a man's heart and mind up see whereby we can do what what's the next step there's a burial or washing of regeneration, see, and, re, and, and receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit, but you gotta be cleaned up, see. You gotta go through a principle where we know we're dead when we come into the school, or we're out here living our lives as we so please, but we do not have an understanding of our creator, see. And we're eating a meal, see. The meal, see, is a true gospel of Yahshua and the Messiah, see. Uh, uh, 
as it says that words were found and I did eat them. See, we're down here eating the meal, see, and Yahshua the Messiah is what? Pushing us along and cleaning us up. Well, what is he cleaning us up for? See, our own thoughts, theories, and opinions. We're being washed, not physically so, see, but the inner man, the soul, there is the outer body and there is an inner body. And the inner body can be cleaned up. And it can be cleaned up, not by water, but it can be cleaned up by the true report or the preaching of the gospel. I, I, I think it's in, um, we'll hold that. Um, but let's let's get that where I continue on. So he said, look, um, come at thou to me. Now, why he's asking Yahshua, see, look, well, why are you coming to me? I have need to be baptized of thee because see, Yahshua, look, he had no sins to confess. He said, well, look, why are you coming to me? <laughs> this is the baptism of repentance. Men are confessing their sins unto John and then they're baptized. But Yahshua said, look, I'm doing something. I got a purpose. I got a plan. I'm fulfilling this thing. When I get baptized, that is it. And I am bringing this to an end. But uh, continue on, Clifford. This is Matthew 3 and 15. And Yahshua answering said unto him, permit it to be so now, for thus it becometh to us, I'm sorry, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then and so he permitted him. And he permitted him. So Yahshua is saying, look, don't worry about that. Suffer it to be so now. Look, we're fulfilling this thing. We're bringing it to an end. Let's get Matthew uh, 5 and 17 as well, because he, you know, he came with a purpose and a purpose see, for Yahshua the Messiah. He's going to move that law out of the way, fulfill that thing, change the ages through his death, burial, and resurrection. He changed the age. He closed out the post-Diluvian age by his death, his burial, and his resurrection. He poured out the gift of the Holy Spirit. And it, talk, it was talked about by the first speaker. We're now residing in the present kingdom age, whereby he's gathering those unto himself. See, that we all might have a place in Yahshua the Messiah, see, but it's a process that we have to go through to get to be a part of the body of Yahshua the Messiah. So let's get that, that other scripture there. That's Matthew 5, 17. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I'm not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, Till heaven and earth pass, one yod, or the smallest part of a letter, shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. So Yahshua the Messiah, he's fulfilling the law. See, he's moving it out of the way that he has a job to do. And so let's go back over to Exodus where you were holding it, where they had to take out a lamb, a male of the first year. They had to take it out from the sheep or from the goats. And I just want to pick up again where he said they had to strike the blood on the door uh, because we know that Yahshua the Messiah, see, he is the door, see. And see, we're talking about Yahshua the Messiah, what? Being in our hearts and being in our minds, see. Having the blood of Yahshua, being clean by the blood, see. I think it was a scripture talking about their robes were made wash white by the blood, but I, I don't want to get that. Uh, but we're just dealing with the principle how Yahshua the Messiah has to be what? In our hearts and in our minds. And he had to put that Yahweh told Moses the last plague. See, look, if, if you don't have the blood on the inside of your house, the deaf angel will pass through at midnight and he's going to smite firstborn man and beast. And that's a that's an important principle, see, because, see, when Yahshua the Messiah, see, uh, rents this thing out, or he, he determines when he's going to rent us out, take us up out of the flesh, see, when this thing is all said and done, see, if we don't have the blood of the Messiah in us, see, that death angel is going to come in and do, destroy what? our firstborn, see, our soul, or our inner man, see, that deaf angel must see the blood on the inside of the house. This is spiritually now. This isn't physically. So it's not like in the movies in the Ten Commandments where they had the blood 
on the outside of the door. See, our blood from a natural standpoint, it's on the inside of our house, on the inside of our physical body. If the blood is on the outside of the body, it's a problem. And we probably seeking medical attention because that's not the way it's supposed to be. But uh, let's go back uh, to Exodus and... Uh, Exodus 12 and 7. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the houses, wherein they shall eat it. And shall eat the flesh in the night, roast with fire and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Eat not of it raw, nor boiled at all with water, but roast with fire, his head with his legs, and with the inner innards thereof. And ye shall not, and ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning, and that which remaineth of it until the morning ye shall burn with fire. Okay, so they had to have the blood on the inside of the door, four points of blood and from a basin. Now we know when Yahshua the Messiah was crucified, they had a what? A four point configuration of blood. They had a crown of thorns on his head, nails in both his hands and nails in his feet. See, Yahshua says, see, look, I am the door. So he had that four point configuration of blood. And also, um, they said, um, you shall let nothing of it remain into the morning. So they had the whole lamb that had to be consumed. So I want to hold it there. And if you can find it, I'm not sure where it is, where Mary, uh, they come to the sepulcher to find Yahshua. But they say he is not here. He is risen because we're talking about how that lamb was a type and shadow of Yahshua the Messiah. But the true lamb, see, Yahshua the Messiah, when he was crucified, he had what? The nails in his hands, his feet. He was buried in Joseph's new tomb. And he resurrected the third part of the day. See, early in the morning when they got to the sepulcher, he was already gone. Or that lamb had to be what? Consumed. You could leave nothing of it until the morning. So he was out of there, see. And they came there looking for what? Looking for the lamb, but it was already gone. He had already resurrected. So if you can find that, and we're talking about the lamb, how that lamb pointed on, onto Yahshua the Messiah. This is Matthew 28 and 1. In the, in the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn towards the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of Yahweh descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. And his countenance was as lightning and the raiment white as snow. For a, for a fear of him, the keepers did shake and became dead men. And the angels answered and said unto the women, Fear ye not, for I know that ye seek Yahshua who was crucified. He is not here. He is risen, as he said. Come and see the place where the master laid. There you go. Say, he is not here. He is risen. So he's, those things are doing nothing but pointing to types and shadows of Yahshua the Messiah so we can get an understanding. Yeah, indeed, our creator is operating by a pattern that, that he hasn't gone off, that we have hope and we have salvation. What? In Yahshua, that he's, he's leading and guiding us in the understanding to show us. See, look, this stuff isn't held to skelter. It's just there is a purpose and there is a pattern in operation whereby you can have some faith that our creator, yes, indeed, after there is a death and burial, then what comes a resurrection. So they ate the meal. Uh, they Let's get for, for, uh, Exodus, the 14th chapter, where they, they come to the waters, as was said um, by the first speaker, they were just, they murmuring, they're complaining, uh, to Moses, uh, 14th and 1, they were, the, the Egyptians were pursuing them uh, and they were afraid. Uh, 
And so um, let's get uh, Exodus 14 and one because they're getting ready to go through a water principle because we know like according to the tabernacle pattern and he went through that um, um, beautifully how these uh, their principles of a death and a burial and a resurrection and even in the court roundabout uh, when you look at the tabernacle, because they're leaving Egypt according to the pattern, which is Yahweh himself. And so when a uh, high priest under the law, when you look at that court roundabout, uh, when the children of Israel committed a sin, uh, they had to offer up a sacrifice in their stead. So if you do something, you had to take out whatever, whichever sin it was, there were particular uh you know, animal, particular steps you needed to do based on what kind of sin you had committed. It would go to the high priest and the high priest would sit, slate, they would have to place their hand on the sacrifice or in essence, they transferring their sins onto the sacrifice. That's see so beautiful how Yahshua the Messiah looks. Say, look, he took on the sins of mankind. See, they were placed on Yahshua and he was crucified. So they placed their hand on the sacrifice. The sacrifice was slain in their stead. See, and then the high priest would put the blood on the four horns on the altar in the same way they put the blood on the four corners of the door, how Yahshua the Messiah was crucified also with the four points of blood on him. And see, then they would wash or bury the sacrifice and the labor. The, height, the, the water would become red. They get ready to go through the Red Sea and uh, let the water out. And then he would refill the labor and wash himself. See, so we know that there was a... Uh, uh, after that, there's a principle of spirit. So the high priest, he had to be anointed, I believe, once before he could officiate in the ministry. So there is a principle of anointing there. So you have a principle in a court roundabout of blood, water, and spirit. And then he would go through that first veil into the holy place where he had some duties there to do. But so we, we see and we understand how the children of Israel are leaving Egypt. See, they put that blood on the door. They ate the meal. They're getting ready to go through the what? Red Sea and being led by a cloud so that pattern is in operation. Their migration is in operation. Yahweh is operating according to the pattern. Yahshua, see, he's crucified. He's the lamb. He's going to be baptized or immersed. And even after he was baptized, maybe we can get that. But first, let's get to uh, the Red Sea with it, 14 and 1 Exodus, where they're, they're just murmuring and complaining. That's <laughs> what's said by the first uh, that's Exodus 14 and 1. And Yahweh spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel that they turn and encamp before Piharihot, Piharihot, uh, between Migdol and the sea, over against Baal Zephon, before it shall ye encamp by the sea. For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, they are entangled in the land. The wilderness hath shut them in. Okay. Thank you. Now, if you could, thank you, Dr. Cardoso. Now, if you could drop down, I want to get to the 11th verse. Um, and then we'll read down a little bit about how they're getting ready to be uh, delivered. See, and they're going to, this Red Sea is going to rise up in a heat. So let's get Exodus 14 and 11. This is Exodus 14 and 11. And they said unto Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt us with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Is not this the word that we did that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone? that we may serve the Egyptians. For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. 
So if we could just pause right there. So they're murmuring and complaining. Yahweh was mad with Israel. And they did that throughout their journeys. Uh, Moses threw himself down. I'm just sick of these folks. Um, that's the best way I can explain. There's a lot of murmuring. And it, and it reminds me of what the first speaker had said. Look, you go through stuff, but it's for your betterment. And see, Yahweh is bringing a body out of Egypt. And they're saying, look, we should have just been down there and just stayed. We had great food. We had the melons. But he's he's operating his purpose. And it was his purpose to bring that body up out of Egypt. See, all right, continue on. This is Exodus 14 and 13. And Moses said unto the people, fear ye not, stand still and see the salvation of Yahweh which he will show to you today. For the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. Yahweh shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. So he's saying, look, stand still and see the salvation. It's the same way as we're going through things. And, um, you know, sometimes even with in our hearts and minds, I'll speak for myself, you know, I've you know, went through a lot of stuff and I'm talking to you, uh, Yahshua, but, you know, it's painful and it's hard. Um, and, uh, you know, the devil would tell you, you had to give this thing up um, and, and just, you know, life would be better if you were doing something else. In the same way, I say, look, why don't we just stay down here in Egypt <laughs> and enjoy the comforts? But that's not according to the purpose of Yahweh. If he purposed to bring you up, he's going to take you on that migration. There's going to be some uh, rocky roads. Uh, we might murmur in our heart and mind, um, but you say, look, I'm bringing you up. And it's some things for your betterment, as was said by the first speaker. And so he delivered them and he told Moses, see, you raise the rod and the children of Israel, they go through on dry ground and say um, what he did. See, he uh, rose up in the heat and they were delivered and they were following a cloud, this cloud. So they had light as they were leaving Egypt. Well, after a period of time, Egypt Goshen head like, but he's they're leaving Egypt by principle of blood, water, and spirit. They're following a the cloud, and it was a light unto them, but it was darkness unto the Egyptians. Because there is a a part that where it said the cloud went before them and went behind them. See, so he was darkness unto the Egyptians or those that were pursuing them, but it was light unto Israel. And that's a, another beautiful principle how Yahweh can divide what? The light from the darkness, see? And he's the only one that can do it. So they come out in the wilderness of Sinai. So they leave in Egypt by principles of blood, water, and spirit. Now we talked about how uh, Yahshua the Messiah was baptized by John, uh, John the Baptist. Let's, let's get um, Matthew four and one because after he's baptized, um, he's gonna also uh, go, um, out into the wilderness, see, where now when the children of Israel got out in the wilderness, murmuring and complaining, <laughs> um, they, uh, you know, okay, let's get Matthew the fourth chapter because I'm digressing. Let's get Matthew. So uh, Yahshua is baptized. Uh, by John the Baptist. So you have the principle of the lamb or you have the principle of blood, you have the principle of water and you have the principle of spirit because he's going to be led into the wilderness as well. Um, the children of Israel, they're going to fail those tests out there in the wilderness, but Yahshua the Messiah, see the word made flesh, he's not going to fail. See, he's going to deal with the satanic spirit that's trying to test him. But the children of Israel, see, they fell short. They built the golden calf. Uh, they were murmuring, complaining, um, just all kinds of stuff. See, Yahweh had to uh, make a division out there in the wilderness. He slew some folks because they, you know, were getting a little you know, he, they were kind of going back and forth with Moses about some stuff. Uh, 
arguing about the purpose of Yahweh, that he set something up through Moses. It was truly Yahweh Elohim, not Moses, but Moses was the type and shadow of an intercessor or mediator, but he was the one that Yahweh had selected to do the job, see? And they had some, ch they had some problems with that. They thought they, you know, wanted to uh, be a part of it too, but that's, see, that's not how it works, see, but it's a process. So let's get that in, in Matthew, the fourth chapter, uh, where four, I believe it's four and one, where he, uh, after he was baptized there and he goes out to the wilderness. This is Matthew four and one. Then Yahshua led up of the spirit unto, into the wilderness to be tempted of the adversary. And after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. So now he's led out to, you know, he it really says tempted, but he's trying to test Yahshua the Messiah because he's not going to overcome him, see. And he was tested. Thank you. I see the sign I have five minutes. He said he was in the wilderness 40 days and 40 nights. And afterwards, he was hungry. I'm sorry. You know what? I had one attempt. I had one. We don't have to get it. It was after the baptism, how a dove overshadowed. Yeah, you don't have to get it while well, the dove straight well you can it's a little bit above that it's gonna be uh matthew 3 and 16 and then i just want to pick up that principle of a spirit so you have the blood water and spirit principle like the egypt uh, when they leave Egypt by principles of blood, water, and spirit, by a cloud, uh, the death, burial, and resurrection, the tabernacle, the altar, the brazen labor, the cup of holy anointing. Are we just looking at these principles of how there is a way to leave Egypt by the blood of Yahshua the Messiah by eating the meal and how he was doing things according to the, the pattern. So... This is Matthew, and I'll take it at verse 15. Matthew 3 and 15. And Yahshua answering said unto him, Permit it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he permitted him. Verse 16. Yahshua, when he was immersed, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the spirit of Yahweh descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So we have the spirit principle, how Yahshua and Messiah, after he was baptized, that spirit principle of a dove. And then we know he was led into the wilderness um, and he fasted 40 days and 40 nights. Then we learned also here, it talks about one day uh, being the children of Israel were disobedient and Yahweh gave them a day for a year. See, they failed the test. So they wandered some 40 years out in the wilderness of Sinai. It was supposed to be, what, 40 days, but they were uh, disobedient. Um, now, so that's a principle of blood, water, and spirit. So now the true washing or the waters that we want to be washed with, see, are the living words. If you can find where it says you're clean by the word, by, there's a point where Yahshua the Messiah, you're clean by the word of Yahweh. And I also want to get John 7 and 36 or 7 and 38. Um, I'm not sure where that is, but um, it's in there. They were clean by the word. See, we're clean by the word of Yahweh. That's the soul or the inner man. It talks about there is an outer body and there is an inner body. So there is some other washings or words, see, that's going to be cleaning up the inner man. See, that's the true ultimate spiritual reality. And I think it was in our, our scripture lesson because it was talking about, then I, th I think it's in Ezekiel. Maybe we can get that if we have time. Ezekiel 36 and 25 or 26. Maybe we can get that. Um, thank you. Someone saw that on the scripture. So whatever you have, you can you can just read that. That's John 15 and 3. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. If Abide you can get 15, 15 and 1 and then read I'll, down to I'll 3. I'll take it from 15 and 1 though. 
So he said, we're clean by the word. And um, you being clean by the word. He didn't say clean with water. And when he sent his disciples out, he said, go you there for and preach. Uh, uh, to all nations that he's sending them out, baptizing them in the name, see, not in water, see, in the name. And they, what they're going to be doing is cleaning people up by the words, see, of Yahweh, see, not by water. And so uh, before I came into the school, I, you know, got baptized in water. That wasn't what he meant. We were baptized with the Holy Spirit and with fire. That's what the Jews received in 80, 30, 83, 34, when Yahshua resurrected, uh, poured out the gift of the Holy Spirit when they were up in the upper room, see, it's by the words, see, and then uh, the Gentiles also received the gift of the Holy Spirit by the preaching of the word over there in Acts. When Peter went to Cornelius' house, it was the preaching of the word, see, that mankind were cleaned up. And I'm sorry I, I ran out of time. I haven't been able to get that. But if anything was gained, all power, all, all honor, all glory, and all power, all of it belongs unto Yahshua the Messiah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Dr. Taylor. And this will conclude class for this evening. I would like to thank all the speakers that came forward and spoke. And I would just have a couple of announcements. Um, I'd like to th uh, thank the uh, visiting brother who helped out, um, Brother Kufa Cardoza from my Malaysia branch. And I would also like to thank um, Dr. Connor, I believe from our Texas branch. And I think that's all a visiting brother in your head. And um, we meet here on Zoom. I'm sorry, we meet on, oh, I'm sorry. Let me start over. We meet every Sunday in person at the Hillside Best Western Hotel located at 4400 Frontage Road in Hillside, Illinois. We meet from 12 p.m. to 2 p.m. Central Standard Time. And again, that's every Sunday. Then we also meet on Zoom every Mondays and Thursdays from 7.30 p.m. to 9.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. If you cannot join us on Zoom, we do live stream via YouTube as well. And um, before I end class, I if we can stay online, I do have, um, we can remain silent and, and then stay online after the session has ended. I have one more announcement after that. But maybe now I'll stand for doxology. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise, you know, I'm our Savior, through Yahshua the Messiah, our Sovereign, belong glory, majesty, dominion, and power, both before all times, now and ever. May we all say hallelujah. <laughs>